Another railway tragedy, seven people die, many are hurt. The derailment hurled a carriage along the platform at Potter's Bar. This is the scene tonight as investigators examine track and train. Emergency services helped scores of casualties. Operations are still going on. Also tonight, Israel pulls out of Bethlehem after the standoff ends at its holiest site. Here, the hard sell for home rule. Westminster's big guns target the northeast to win the battle for regional government. And a crackdown on curb crawlers, they could end up losing their cars. Good evening. There's been another tragedy on the railways, the sixth fatal accident in as many years. Despite hundreds of millions being spent on safety, seven people died and scores were injured this afternoon when a passenger train came off the rails just north of London. Six of the injured are critically ill. The West Anglia Great Northern Service left London's King's Cross station for King's Lynn in Norfolk at 12.45, carrying 151 passengers. Nine minutes into the journey, the rear of the train jumped the rails as it approached Potter's Bar station at around 100 miles an hour. The rear carriage struck a bridge, then mounted the platform, smashing into the station's waiting areas. Tonight, investigators are working under floodlights at the scene trying to piece together what went wrong. And Gavin Hewitt is there. Gavin. Well, Peter, this has become an all too familiar sight. Behind me tonight, teams of investigators from Rail Track and the Railways Police sifting through the wreckage, trying to determine what happened. They are now certain there are no more bodies at the scene. And tonight, investigators are focusing on the set of points a couple of hundred metres away as a possible cause. This has been another tragic day for Britain's railways. This was the scene at Potter's Bar station today at around one o'clock. The last of four carriages of the train from King's Cross to King's Lynn lying across the platform wedged under the station roof. The train had been travelling at over 90 miles an hour when its last carriage began shuddering. People on the platform were terrified as the carriage, having broken loose, tore through a waiting room and slid towards them. Everyone just turned around and pegged it, dropped what they were holding and ran the other way. All we saw initially was bodies laying on the rail, heard screaming uh, and just saw smoke and dust settling from the train. The first sign of trouble came as the train approached a bridge just outside the station. The driver reported feeling a bump. The last carriage sideswiped the bridge, pieces broke loose, falling on the cars underneath. I see all dust coming up from the bridge, so I, I, I didn't know what happened. And then uh, I just thought the train just went past the bridge and just the bridge gave way. And, but then I looked to the left, just down there, and I see the train like sideways, and I was just well shocked. A section of the wheels flew off and the carriage mounted the platform, turning on its side. The first three carriages continued down the track, but those inside knew the train was in difficulty. Well, I thought we jumped the points to start with, and then it started to rock from side to side. So I sort of held on tightly to the table, and then it stopped. Fortunately, the driver must have been very good, and he stopped very, very quickly. A major incident was declared. Many of the emergency services had attended the Hatfield crash and knew immediately what to do when they arrived here. Air ambulances were used to lift some of the most seriously injured to hospital. And some people had incredible escapes. They were close to the platform when the carriage crashed. There was the gap between the platform and the floor, the, the rails. We could actually get under the train. So we went under the train, um, you know, didn't even think whether it'd fall or anything, we just went. And as we come out, you could just, there were just bodies everywhere. It was like, a, I don't know, like a battlefield. It was like, just people had obviously been flung from the, from the coach. Many local people clambered over the tracks to help those trapped inside the overturned carriage. We managed to get some of the windows open and, and helped people out. Um, most people had got some sort of injury. A lot of them, mercifully, were very minor. There were several different kinds of injuries, head injuries, there was a lady with her leg dislocated. Um, probably the hardest thing I had to deal with, one of the ladies that I was 
holding her hand, her partner had phoned at that specific time when I had to tell her partner what had happened. The cause of the accident is still unclear, but investigators are now focusing on the set of points just outside the station. Earlier, they had covered the points with a tarpaulin to protect potential evidence. The investigation will continue through the night. As to the passengers on the train, they had left on special buses, having been cared for in a local supermarket. Many of them look back at the crash scene, perhaps unaware that just 18 months ago, on the same line, a few miles away at Hatfield, there had been another fatal accident on Britain's rail network. Seven people died in the accident and scores more were injured. The most seriously hurt were taken to the nearby Barnet General Hospital from where Karen Allen reports. Within minutes of the crash and the first of the most critical injured began to arrive. Two miles from the scene, staff here at Barnet General Hospital activated their major incident plan. Seven patients were brought here, a further ten to neighbouring Chase Farm Hospital. By mid-afternoon, the most seriously injured had been sent for specialist care. Um, well, there have been two patients um, arriving with head injuries and they've now been transferred to the Royal Free Hospital. That has a specialist head injury unit. Uh, the remainder have stayed here and they've had open fractures, chest injuries, abdominal injuries and lots of, lots of additional cuts and bruises. So it's, these people have been through a major incident. By four o'clock, the news that despite the efforts of casualty staff here, one man had died. Four other patients were undergoing emergency surgery. A few miles away at Chase Farm Hospital, patients were being treated for shock and bruising. Mark Guest, who was asleep at the time, described the moment of impact. We heard a bang and what felt like the carriages coming away from the tracks. And then the sequence of events started, the rolling of the carriage. Um, it all happened very quickly. Conscience more or less all the way through it. Heard the glass shattering out the windows. Uh, and then come to a standstill and it was a case of just make your way out of the nearest window where obviously you saw the, the wreckage on the platform. A major incident like this has evoked memories of the Hatfield rail crash two years ago. Many of the staff here were directly involved in that. Tonight the focus has switched from accident and emergency to intensive care. After hours undergoing life-saving surgery, many of the injured will spend days if not weeks here. Karen Allen, BBC News at Barnet General Hospital. And the latest news we're hearing from the hospital is that there are still 10 people very seriously injured. Peter. Gavin, for now, thank you. An emergency telephone line has been set up for people concerned about friends or relatives who may have been on the train. The number is 0845 944 1551. The investigation into why the accident happened has already begun. Officials from the Health and Safety Executive are paying particularly close attention to the last set of points the train crossed just before Potter's Bar Station. David Shookman reports. This is how train drivers see the approach to Potter's Bar Station heading towards London. A fast line, a routine trip, but this is the exact point where today the train smashed into these same platforms. Now, beneath that blue tarpaulin, lie the clues to what went wrong. Maybe it was the points, maybe a wheel failure. We can't tell. All we know is what happened, not why. So let's look at the sequence of events. The train was approaching Potter's Bar station at close to 100 miles an hour, all perfectly normal. It looks as if the disaster started at or near the points just outside the station. Perhaps they shifted, perhaps something broke on the train. Whatever. The last of the four carriages hit the side of this bridge, losing a set of wheels. The front three carriages travelled on as normal, but that last carriage carried on sideways, still at high speed, and ended up at right angles across two platforms. The big task now is to find clues. Investigators are now weighing up the options. Vandalism and driver error seem least likely, which leaves failure with the track or with the train. I asked Chris Milner of Railway Magazine how this could have happened. 
Well, there is a, a possibility, and obviously the investigators will look at this, as whether the points moved between the first set of wheels of the last carriage going over it and the, the last set of wheels, which would obviously give the twisting motion. So those points could have been at fault? It is a possibility, yes. Is it also possible that something went wrong with the train itself, or in that last carriage? Well, it could have been down to, the again, the axle and wheel failure, which should have, could have caused the train wheels and the bogey to collapse and, and, and give that a skewing movement. Failure with the track would reopen the nightmare of Hatfield. The crash nearly two years ago was caused by a cracked rail. The entire network had to be checked. Maybe even now, track is still faulty. So tonight, as the search teams move in, the fear is that the railways will again have to be scrutinised, that public confidence will again be damaged, and that the whole country will again have to endure massive disruption. David Truckman, BBC News. Today's accident is the latest in a series which have undermined the public's confidence in the rail service. Within the last hour, the chief executive of Railtrack has defended his company's commitment to safety and said no stone would be left unturned in attempts to discover what had happened. Kings Cross Station tonight, and once again commuters face disruption in the wake of a major rail accident. An industry struggling to recover from a crisis has been hit by another blow to the confidence of its customers. Well, it's awful to hear again because we've heard so much about them in the last year or so. It's just a nightmare. It's awful to think, think that it can be happening again with the rail service. The, the safety of passengers is far more important than simply getting trains to and from their destinations on time. It was the Hatfield crash coming so soon after the fatal accidents at Panton and Southall which underlined the urgent need to repair a neglected network. That operation put immense strain on Railtrack's finances, but there were still warnings that it wasn't proceeding rapidly enough to prevent more accidents. Tonight, the man brought in last December to head Railtrack was questioned about the state of the track at Potter's Bar. There is no reason to believe that the condition of the track um, was in anything other than the condition that we would expect it to be for normal working order. Um, clearly the investigation uh, will, will show whether there were uh, any faults in the track uh, with which we were clearly unaware. Railtrack's future still has to be decided by the government which put the firm into administration last October and now the minister in charge has to handle the aftermath of today's crash. I've asked the health and safety executive to carry out an investigation. They already have safety investigators at the scene. I've asked them to report to me as soon as possible. But I think in the immediate few hours after this accident our thoughts really must be with the family and the friends of those people who have died today at Potter's Bar. It's still safer to travel by rail than road, a message repeated by the government and the rail companies tonight. But they now face questions about whether they've moved quickly enough to improve safety. Rory Catlin Jones, BBC News. And we're joined here in the studio by our business editor, Jeff Randall. Jeff, what's in the minds of rail track executives tonight? Well, I think they'll be devastated, Peter. They'll be thinking, oh no, not again. I mean, they know that they are charged with delivering a safe and efficient railway, and sadly in recent years, that's just not happened. They have some really difficult questions to ask themselves. Will they be vulnerable to accusations that being in administration, preoccupied by their own financial difficulties, their own structure, that they took their eyes off safety? Well, I think it's unfair to point the finger of blame tonight, Peter, but inevitably, as this investigation unfolds, that allegation will be made, uh, and it will be made many times. The company will ask itself that question, but I think uh, it's more likely to be asked of the Secretary of State, Stephen Byers, because, of, of course, the company didn't force itself into administration. He pushed it into administration uh, last October, and I suspect he will have some very difficult moments in the, in the next weeks. Even more difficult moments. What's the key to restoring confidence for rail track? I think in the short term, Peter, it's almost impossible to restore public confidence because those pictures are so horrific. But it's very important that the company does get over the message that rail is still a safe way to travel in Britain. It's certainly much safer than road. And compared with our European partners, we do not have a bad record for safety. But of course, that will be of no comfort to those who've lost friends and family tonight. Jeff Randall, thank you. I mean, I'll now go back to Gavin Hewitt at the scene of the accident in Potter's Bar. Gavin, I gather you have some further news for us. Uh, what is it? 
Well, Peter, the, the news is not good. I'm afraid we've heard from the local hospital uh, that an eighth person has died from this accident tonight. And as I said a short while ago, there are still 10 others who are very seriously injured. Gavin, suspicion seems to be falling tonight on those points that we've been talking about. The last ones, the train passed before it hit the station. Um, are investigators saying anything about it at the site? Well, first of all, they're saying this is exactly what they would look at in any case. Um, but the points are only a, a couple of hundred metres away from me here, and that is the focus of attention. They're not saying a great deal, but I can tell you what they're looking at. They're looking to see, is the metal twisted? Uh, is there a buckling in the metal just either before the points or just off the point, or just after the points, that could explain why suddenly the fourth carriage went loose? But I should underline here that they say that they would do this in any investigation. Um, but that's certainly what they're looking at here tonight. Gavin, for now, thank you. There'll be more on the rail crash later, but now the rest of the day's news. The siege of Bethlehem's Church of the Nativity has ended. More than 100 Palestinians were holed up in the church for nearly six weeks, surrounded by Israeli troops. 13 of the Palestinians have been flown to Cyprus and exile. Our correspondent Orla Girin was one of the first journalists to get inside the church. The moment of freedom after 39 long days. Kissing the ground he's leaving behind, the militants being bussed to Gaza or to a life in exile abroad. <laughs> from the rooftops, a wife trying to call her husband, and from the ground, a last wave. Next, the wounded carried out. During the siege, Israel killed seven men it claims were armed, but it also killed the bell ringer. They're taking us by power to the Israeli police. Next out, reluctantly, international protesters. They'd sneaked in to support the Palestinians. We were among the first to enter the church, closed to the world since the siege began. And this is what we found inside. No massive damage, but all the signs of a long, hard stay for the 120 people who were hemmed in here. This priest telling me how they struggled to survive. We weren't uh, suspecting a war in, in Bethlehem and uh, nothing like this. So uh, we always have uh, stock. So we had uh, five uh, sacks of rice and a big sack of uh, beans. Hunger and squalor in a holy place. Blame the militants, says Israel, for hiding in here. Well, this is where the gunmen were sleeping inside the church, and this is the mess they left behind. When they came running in here as the Israeli army advanced, they couldn't have picked a safer refuge. They knew the troops would not want to come storming in here and risk having a bloodbath on sacred ground. But the army insists the gunmen were ready for one, showing us these weapons and homemade bombs today, claiming to have found 40 explosive devices inside the church. <laughs> Arriving in Gaza, these militants were defiant, pledging to fight on all the way to their own state. Israel lost its battle to get them behind bars. But back in Manger Square, Israeli soldiers happy to be leaving tonight, ending the biggest assault on the West Bank in 20 years. Priests filing back into the church now that the troops are gone. But as Bethlehem celebrates its freedom, fears that Israel could strike Gaza after the latest suicide bombing. One crisis over here, and the next one may soon begin. Orlegirin, BBC News, Manger Square in Bethlehem. Customs and Excise are investigating a British company which tried to sell anti-personnel landmines three years after they were banned by the government. BBC Radio 4's Today programme revealed that PW defence systems were offering the landmines for sale at an arms fair. The company denies it's done anything illegal. Members of FIFA's executive committee have begun legal action against their president, Sepp Blatter. They claim hundreds of millions of pounds have been lost through mismanagement and illegal payments. The murder conviction of James Hanratty, the man hanged for the A6 murder 40 years ago, has been upheld by the Court of Appeal. The review followed a long campaign by his family to prove his innocence. 
The Queen's been demonstrating her growing enthusiasm for football in the run-up to the World Cup. Today, as part of her Jubilee tour, she met the England manager, Sven Joran Eriksson, and two of his England squad at the National Sports Centre at Bisham Abbey in Buckinghamshire. The Queen has seen many remarkable feats in her time. Today, she watched a man use his feet to smash a slab of wood. She's never been notably interested in sports which don't involve horses. But the World Cup, of course, is different. And the Queen spent several minutes in conversation with the England coach, Sven Joran Eriksson, and two members of the England squad, Arsenal's Sol Campbell and Owen Hargreaves of Bayern Munich. The England captain, David Beckham, whose injured foot the Queen expressed concern about two weeks ago, was absent. But at least England now know that they have the Queen's good wishes behind them. She wished us uh, good luck, of course, for the World Cup and uh, also about the weather in Japan and so on. Two weeks of the Jubilee Tour have elapsed. There are 12 to go, and for the Palace, the signs are promising. From the southwest to the northeast of England to the east end of London and now to the home counties, this Jubilee Tour is certainly bringing the crowds out and in greater numbers than even the Palace had expected. And the large crowds were out again in the town of Marlow, where the Queen unveiled a statue of its local hero, the Olympic rower Sir Stephen Redgrave. He had lots of stamina, which is what the Queen will need to keep this Jubilee tour on the road. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News, Bisham Abbey. Now back to today, tonight's main news, the rail crash at Potter's Bar. Seven people have died and many more are injured. George Ekin has spent the day at the scene of the accident. Apart from the hum of generators, the centre of Potter's Bar is hushed and more or less at a standstill this Friday night, as you'd expect after a tragedy like this. Engineers are using arc lights to work into the night, clearing the wrecked fourth carriage and other debris from the station. It may take several days. This is on the East Coast main line, and the crash will disrupt services to and from Northern England and Scotland too. The next stage is to establish the cause of this incident. British Transport Police will work with Her Majesty's rail inspectors and rail track to investigate fully the circumstances surrounding today's crash. Officials have already started their investigations into this crash. At this stage, it's thought driver error is unlikely. Police sources have privately played down the likelihood of vandalism, which leaves the track, the signals, and perhaps most importantly, the points. But question marks hanging over the rail industry aren't the main issue for those who've been in Potter's Bar today. People have died here. One of them already unconscious as a young man tried in vain to keep her alive. He'd been one of those on the platform as the fourth carriage hurtled towards him. First thing I did was panic. Uh, second thing I done was look under the platform, get onto the rail, run around the rail, seeing how many people there was there and if there was anyone who could like need the help. People here are only too aware that this horrific derailment, sending a carriage slewing on its side onto the platform of their station, could have caused even more death and injury. The train came in from the right, over a bridge, passing just above a busy street and shopping area. The terrible force of a few violent seconds is wrought in the twisted steel of the bridge railings and in the platform waiting room, smashed like matchwood. It's too soon to say what wider consequences this tragedy will have. For now, the overriding sense here is one of loss and of a need for answers. George Eakin, BBC News, Potter's Bar. I said that uh, seven had died a few moments ago. In fact, as Gavin Hewitt told us earlier, that has now sadly ridden, risen to eight. We go back to Gavin now. Gavin, one consolation at the end of this dreadful day is that the emergency services were very fast off the mark. Well, so many people have spoken to me about how quickly they found the emergency services here. In fact, the ambulance service has a station about uh, 300 metres away. But there was another factor. Many of the people who've worked here throughout the day had also attended the Hatfield crash, and they knew precisely what to do. They had rehearsed the routine. So when they got here, they knew how to break into the carriage, they knew how to treat people here on the platform, uh, and I think everybody here accepts that live lives were saved because the emergency service had had practice but also had worked in it during the past 18 months. Of course Hatfield is just three stations up the track 
Um, th there was no public inquiry after that, Gavin. Would you expect the pressure to be on for one here? Well, you could ask, what more can we learn about our railway system? All I can tell you is what the reaction is on the people on the streets here. You could see them standing by the police tape, looking incredulous at the scene of another rail crash and asking, how could it happen again? And of course there are people here who remembered uh, Hatfield, had people who were injured at Hatfield, and they were incredulous, but they were also angry. And I think they would like to see something done, maybe not an inquiry, but at least a sense that something at last was being done about our railway system. Gabby Hewitt at tonight's, uh, today's Potter's Bar tragedy. Thank you. Well, it's now 25 past 10. I'll be back a little later with an update on the day's headlines, but now we join our news teams across the United Kingdom. Good evening. Within hours of announcing plans to give the region home rule, key government ministers arrived in the North East to sell the idea. The Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott today promised a referendum in the next 18 months. Keen to bridge the gap between Westminster and the region, Mr Prescott was out early preaching his message about regional parliament. Minister for the region, Stephen Byers, was there too. He kept a low profile as calls for his resignation continued. Supporters of Home Rule claim it would encourage more projects like the Gateshead Quayside development. That coordinated budgets for planning, culture and industrial support in the region. Mr Prescott has been enthusiastically pushing the idea of regional parliaments for a quarter of a century. Now he hopes he hasn't much longer to wait. I think it's entirely possible if the people in this uh, region say they want the referendum and it's up to them to quickly make that decision, you would be able to get the referendum during this uh, lifetime of this parliament, of this government. If we went the full five years, it might be possible even to get the assembly, but we will certainly have the referendum decision. But it's up to the people in this region. We've given you the free framework, now we say, get on with the debate, make the decision and make it happen. Already speculation is mounting about where a regional parliament might be based. This afternoon, the ministers headed to the south of the region, so they're not seen to be biased. Persistent curb crawlers in Middlesbrough now risk having their cars confiscated. The unprecedented move by Cleveland police is designed to deter men who drive long distances to buy sex in Middlesbrough. Doug Morris has been on patrol with the vice unit. Middlesbrough at night, the only town or city in northeast England with a large street prostitution problem. Cleveland's vice unit wants persistent curb crawlers to lose their cars. Recent campaigns have driven down the number of local men prowling the streets. Seven out of ten now come from as far away as Manchester, Newcastle and the Scottish borders to buy sex. We have uh, ongoing murder inquiries, we have rape inquiries, we have attacks, we have violence, all linked to prostitution. Men are travelling from all over the, the North East, travelling into Middlesbrough seeking sex. The message to these men, we don't want you, we will catch you, we will prosecute you. If it means ruining your lives, that's what we'll do. Cars will be sold at auction or scrap, with the proceeds going back to the police, or the vehicles will be used by the force. A routine arrest of a curb crawler. He's travelled some distance to pay a woman for sex in Middlesbrough. He spoke to me on the condition that his words were revoiced by an actor. I'm in shock, to be honest. The people I spoke to in the pub come down to this area to see the girls, and they never have a problem, and they come quite often. In the last three years, more than 500 men have been arrested for curb crawling here in Middlesbrough. They've been fined something like two, three or four hundred pounds and they've been named and shamed. But now persistent offenders can face something far greater than a fine. They could actually lose the use of their cars. Police in Stockton are investigating the suspicious death of a 29-year-old drug user. The body of Robert Parkin was found on a makeshift bed in a flat in Shaftesbury Street. Police believe the man they've described as a drifter may have been murdered. The officer in charge wants information from other drug users and is asking them to call his personal mobile phone. The type of inquiry that I've got here, um, people I would expect are not going to voluntarily come, come forward to the police with information. Uh, it'll be a difficult investigation to establish exactly what's happened to this man. So I've taken the step, unusual though it is, of providing a confidential telephone hotline direct to me. 
And I would ask anybody who has any information regarding this man's movements over the last few days, or indeed what's happened to him, to ring me, uh, and, and that information will be checked in the strictest of confidence. One of the foremost experts in foot and mouth disease has been giving evidence at the trial of pig farmer Bobby Woff. Professor Soren Alexanderson said lesions on the animals at the Head and Pig Unit showed they'd had the disease for almost two weeks. Mr Woff denies 16 charges of animal cruelty and flouting animal health laws, including failing to notify authorities of an outbreak of foot and mouth disease. On to football news now, and two of our clubs face their biggest games of the season this weekend. Sunderland need a point at home to Derby to guarantee Premiership safety, and Whitley Bay are at Villa Park for their first ever national final, the Carlsberg FA Vars. Well, Debbie Waldron is with them in Birmingham. Five-hour coach journeys are never much fun, but at least Whitley Bay travelled to Birmingham in style, in a coach loaned to them by Newcastle United. Nice come to a bus, had a few games of cards, enjoyed it. With the closure of Wembley, Villa Park staged its first Vars final last season. But for both Whitley Bay and Tiptree United, tomorrow's game will be a truly momentous occasion. It's, it's such a thrill to be here in this position now. Did you ever think you'd be playing in the final of a national competition like this? You always dream of things like this, but at 21 year old, I mean, it doesn't get any better, does it? If, if we can perform uh, to our capabilities, um, you know, we should come out winners. Um, the problem comes where uh, if we don't perform, uh, you know, and we let ourselves down, and that lets Tiptree into the game. Are you looking forward to it? Yeah, we can't wait. Um, just want to get a good night's sleep now and get ready for tomorrow. Of course, there's inevitably disappointment among some of the players that they're not going to be running out beneath the famous Twin Towers. But if they win tomorrow, this Whitley Bay team will come away with some very fond memories of Villa Park. Sure they will. The weather now, mostly dry tonight. Temperatures down to about 7 Celsius, 45 Fahrenheit. Tomorrow, starting cloudy, drier and brighter in the afternoon. Temperatures rising to 15 Celsius, 59 Fahrenheit. A little bit cooler on the Cumbrian coast. And that's just about it from me for tonight, but I'm back with the news and sport. There's no escape at 5.25 tomorrow. For now, though, it's back to Peter Sissons in London for tonight's main headlines from the team for now. Good night. And the main news tonight, eight people have died in a rail accident at Potter's Bar in Hertfordshire. More than 30 others needed hospital treatment, and at least nine are said to be in a serious condition. An investigation has begun into what caused the 1245 West Anglia Great Northern service from King's Cross to King's Lynn in Norfolk to leave the tracks. The train jumped the rails as it approached Potter's Bar station at around 100 miles an hour. The rear carriage struck a bridge, then mounted the platform, smashing into the station's waiting areas. There'll be more on today's crash on Newsnight, which is starting now over on BBC Two. But from the 10 o'clock news, good night. Good evening to you. Two prizes for North East England today. First of all, we had Leeds at the warmest at 21 degrees and Loftus just up the road at only 10 degrees. The reason being, yet again, the wind was onshore coming in off the cold sea. All that's going to change in the next day or so. The winds actually will come in from the south or the southwest, so it should be turning warmer. But at the same time, those winds are going to be pretty strong. And that's not really the end of the story. All right, we're going to get rid of one area of low pressure and the showery bursts of rain that we've seen today. But in its place, an even deeper area of low pressure coming swinging in during the course of Monday. Loads of isobars. That means to say, of course, as we've seen, it's going to be windy, but it's also going to be wet. And later on in the weekend, a repeat performance in northern and western parts. Still very unsettled and very wet through Spain, much of France, and some of that cloud was spilling up into eastern parts of this country during the course of the night through the day too. Bursts of rain working their way northwards across Scotland. One or two bursts of rain coming across East Anglia and the southeast as well. Now most of that's faded away. There might be a few spots left in the southeast uh, during the course of the night. One or two showers coming into northwestern parts as well. Some mistiness in other areas and a reasonably mild night I think in most parts. Tomorrow it might start off grey and misty in one or two spots but basically for much of the country it's going to be dry with a reasonable amount of sunshine. Some cloud around admittedly. Just the odd shower perhaps in southeastern parts, one or two cropping up elsewhere. Most of the showers, the heaviest ones, most frequent ones, will be in that northwestern corner where the wind will be freshening all the while, making it feel a bit on the cool side. But in the south and southeast, 
I think a pleasantly warm afternoon at about 18 degrees, but still maybe some of those coasts, especially the northeastern corner of England, staying on the cool side. Hopefully by Sunday that wind will have swung around so that the east coast will be warmer. Most places will be dry, I think, on Sunday with a fair amount of sunshine. After a chilly start, there could well be some frost around uh, first thing, and there's just the outside chance, perhaps, of an odd shower. Now, over the weekend, we have the 10 tours uh, taking place, the hike. I think there might be the shower or two there to begin with tomorrow, but otherwise it's fine and probably ideal conditions. So over the weekend, a lot of sunshine to be had and fairly reasonable temperatures, as you can see there. Just one or two showers perhaps uh, in London to begin with tomorrow and as we saw in that northwestern corner of Scotland. But it's a very different day on Monday. We start off chilly again in eastern areas and bright, but during the course of the day, wet and very windy weather will sweep northeastwards across most parts of the country, followed in turn by brighter weather with blustery showers. Have a lovely weekend.